Hi everyone, hope you're all having a great afternoon. Welcome to our webinar on starting and maintaining an effective It's My Life Peer Partner Support Group. My name is Emily Scahill. I'm the Peer Advocacy Support and Services Associate at Mental Health America's National Office. Today we'll talk about Mental Health America's It's My Life Peer Partners Program, a group-based social self-directed care program to combat the effects of loneliness. A number of MHA affiliates across the country are running these groups right now, including the Mental Health Association in Passaic County in New Jersey. We'll hear about what they've learned during their first few months of having an active program. Today's presenters are Patrick Hendry of MHA's National Office and Denise Babin of MHA of Passaic County. Patrick is the Vice President of Peer Advocacy, Supports, and Services at Mental Health America and has worked as a mental health advocate for the past 24 years. His areas of expertise include peer-provided services, self-directed care, recovery-based trainings, organizational development, and management and sustainability. Patrick received MHA's highest honor, the Clifford W. Beers Award in 2012, and a SAMHSA Voice Award and Eli Lilly Reintegration Lifetime Achievement Award in 2014. He is the former executive director of the Florida Peer Network and has assisted in the development of numerous peer-run programs and organizations. Denise is the Director of Outreach Services at Mental Health Association in Passaic County, where she's worked for 22 years. She has participated on the Consumer Advisory Committee on Education and Training, Systems Review Committee, and the Consumer Public Policy Committee. She has also served on consumer panels and has spoken about her reco recovery at the Crisis Intervention Team and screener trainings in collaboration with Rutgers University. She takes every opportunity to better the system by advocating for others to empower themselves and use their own voices to speak for changes in the system. So some quick notes before we get started. At the top of your screen in the gray start meeting box, there's a chat bubble which you can click on to open up a messaging window. So Patrick and Denise will be asking for feedback throughout the webinar. So if you have any comments or questions or any technolo technology issues throughout, go ahead and post them in there. Um, either I'll get back to you or we'll go through them at the end. And if we don't get to them all, we'll be posting them to a new section of our website, centerforpeersupport.org, which will be up and running in the next few weeks. We'll also be recording the webinar and sending it out along with the slides afterwards. So with that, I'll hand it over to Patrick and Denise to get started. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Emily. Patrick, and you I should have, have control. control. <laughs> You don't right now? It says you are. You should be good. No. Could you change, please? Yeah. So we're going to talk about the It's My Life Peer Partners Program. And uh, I think most of you who are on the call today have are familiar with it. We've done a number of events around it over the last few years. We now have um, eight partners around the country uh, our MHA affiliates that are engaging the program and they're at various points in that process. The whole purpose of It's My Life is to overcome the social exclusion and, and loneliness. And this is a, a, a problem for so many of us who experience mental health issues in our lifetime. Um, isolation can be caused by social exclusion. It can be caused by our own uh, pulling away from people around us or sometimes in fear of meeting new people. And so Peer Partners was designed to find a way that peer support could aid people in reconnecting to the community or maybe even connecting for the first time. Um, it's structured as a support group and it's facilitated by a peer specialist and they work together with people to develop their own social goals. Um, People have, you know, various social goals. One thing we have found out over the years, though, is that uh, most people, their main goal is to build friendships. And we, over the several years ago, before we really started talking a lot about recovery, a number of peer-run organizations around the country sent out a series of surveys asking people what, was the, what were the elements that contributed most to their own recovery. And for two or three years in a row, the number one thing was having at least one friend, at least one person that you could count on that had your back. 
So we know how important this is, and it's been our goal throughout this process to really try to develop this peer-run intervention that will make a major difference to individuals. Mental health problems are some of the leading causes of loneliness and isolation. There are other causes sometimes as people age and they begin to lose family members and friends and things, then people can sink into loneliness. Living in rural environments can be quite um, excluding experience because it's so, so difficult to come together with friends. But we do know that mental health problems are the number one issue. And we also know that loneliness and exclusion has tremendous effects on our overall health. Um, we know that uh, social exclusion and loneliness contributes to overall poor health and early mortality. And so it's very important that each of us try to find within ourselves a way to connect to the world around us to meet our own personal needs and to feel like we are fully members of the community in which we live. <clears throat> so we know that approaches like medication and hospitalization and even therapy have a limited effect in uh, trying to promote socialization and that they, they are not very effective in helping people with psychiatric abilities to overcome that tendency to pull away or to overcome society's uh, tendencies to push us to the fringes of community. So as I said, our goal with Peer Partners is to help build networks of friends and intimate relationships, thereby creating a strong social support system. You know, positive social connections increase self-esteem and our feelings of self-worth. Self-esteem and self-worth are critical to self-love. And there's a famous quote by Oscar Wilde, to love oneself is the beginning of a lifelong romance. And this is absolutely true. You know, if we don't love ourselves, if, we, if we're put into a position where we feel that we're losing our self-esteem and our sense of self in, in the world around us, then we begin to let go of all connections, and eventually we end up as very lonely people. Um, and, this, and this not only affects our mental health, but as I said before, our physical health overall. Separation is what we have right now. And, and as I said, this can be caused by a number of different things. But people with, with mental health issues tend to be separate from day-to-day -day society. Um, some of it, as I said, society is responsible for and some of it we are. Uh, a lot of programs through community mental health and even private mental health services try very hard and are sometimes successful at integrating people into the community. And that means that we can live and work and care in the community, but we're not really a part of the community. We still maintain kind of a separateness within the community. We may go to social events, we may, you know, participate in classes somewhere, but our circle of, of relationships and supports uh, tends to be people who have similar issues to our own. Our real goal here with this program is to create a gateway to integration without, um, excuse, excuse me, to a gateway to inclusion. And inclusion is when you actually become a full-fledged member of your, your community and your community counts on you to bring your own richness and value to the community as much as we count on the community to provide these opportunities for us. So one of the things we're trying to do with today's webinar is we want to open a discussion between the groups that are providing this new program around the country and anyone else who might be interested in providing it. We, we know that with the eight groups that we uh, have started in this past year, each group is experiencing certain kinds of problems. Frequently, it's difficult to start a new support group because you people trickle in at their own time and some people will participate for a certain amount of time and then withdraw. 
and that can make it difficult to kind of create this this sense of unity and team that we want in this program. So we're going to have opportunities, as uh, Emily said before, any time during this this uh, webinar today, if you have any thoughts, questions, comments, suggestions, please write them in. And at the end of uh, Denise's uh, presentation, we will try to get to each one. If we're not able to get to all of them today, we already have um, our website, which is called Center for Peer Support. You can find it by going through the Mental Health America website, or you can go straight to it by centerforpeersupport.org. And in that, we have a short section right now on social self-directed care and the It's My Life program. We're going to expand that into a much different thing that's interactive with our audience. So you will be able to, there, within the next few weeks, we should have a link up where you can connect to a, a forum or a chat room where people can post questions, suggestions, comments, anything. People can post links to other kinds of self-help um, or skill building tools that are out there that might be helpful for people trying to build their connection to community. You know, because Peer Partners is based on a support group model, it can be difficult to get a full group. And, and, and you know, most of us have at some point in our lives, those of us who live with psychiatric uh, diagnoses, have had some experience with support groups. And we know that um, when a group is small, it's hard to get the kind of interaction and exchange of information that really brings life to the group. And so we've seen over a history, and there's been a number of articles written about this, that a really good number of people for a very effective and successful support group is somewhere between, between 10 and 12 people. It can be larger, it can be slightly smaller, but that number tends to give us enough variety and then you have people who come and go throughout the life of the group. So as I said, we're going to uh, hear about the types of issues that one group, MHA, Passaic County in New Jersey has faced through this group discussion that we're talking about. We're gonna brainstorm some creative ideas about how to face and overcome the types of barriers that Passaic County has encountered and any of the other groups. So Denise Babin of MHA Passaic County will lead us through the process they've used to develop their program. And she'll discuss the successes and the barriers and through her descriptions, we'll begin to develop a strategy to improve the program. And this is not meant to just be a commentary on the success of Denise's group. Um, it's meant to be something that will be advantageous and valuable to each of us as we uh, get our groups going and begin to really build this, this really unique type of support. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Denise, and uh, she will tell us about their program. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. Hi, everybody. Um, so the first thing that we did uh, when we got our group started is that um, we share space in an agency. We have an outpatient department. Just explaining the space a little bit of the MHA Passaic County is that we share our, our space with different programs. So basically we had to ask um, where in the agency would we hold uh, the group? Um, basically shared space. If we shared space with others in, in the agency, uh, what time would we have to um, get that place available for us, the time, the date, and um, also brainstorm with others in the agency. Maybe they could get referrals from other agencies or we could get a, um, referrals from um, the outpatient department. Um, we picked our time was a Tuesday from um, 3.30 to 4.30, one hour. Uh, but then we found out that the individual said, well, we're showing up, we're coming from 
um, a little further away and for an hour, it doesn't really pay off. So then uh, we developed the program to where now we're meeting from 3.30 to 5 in the afternoon. And it works for them and it works as well for us. So, um, and then also what is important, if you do have a front desk in your agency and um, they're coming through the front uh, of the building, uh, give a list of the people that are coming in or introduce the people that are going to be coming to uh, the program uh, so that um, they will just be, you know, helped out and brought into the conference room uh, we, where we meet. Um, when we got the word out, um, the first group that we started, um, we created an introduction letter. And um, we also created a flyer, um, a very appealing a flyer, very easily to read. Because uh, sometimes in some agencies, they just put up the flyers. And when the, um, somebody um, reads it, um, they can, it's very familiar. It's very easy to read, as you can see. Uh, my name is on there, uh, the web, uh, my um, email address, and then just where we meet, and then just the date and um, the time of the group. And then um, share with other peer programs, drop-in centers, respite centers we contacted, uh, professional groups I contacted, um, and did some presentations to the integrated case management teams. They might be named different in where you're from. Or I did re just recently reach out to um, the programs for assertive community treatment and so forth. And I've also been learning that I needed to keep those contacts fresh, so up-to-date those contacts, call them over and over again, so that um, I think the referral sources don't get cold, as I put it. And also we use social media. Uh, we put it on our web page that we had a new group forming. Uh, we um, put um, articles in newspapers. We did a press release before the a group started. So getting the word out and all that took some time before we actually started the group. Um, so we knew very early on um, the preparation. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, no, the next one, yes. So, yes, thank you. So um, we needed some practical things, a space to meet. Um, we needed a coffee maker for coffee because we do take a break, a tw 10 uh, to 15-minute break in between the group. Uh, we needed a copier. We needed... Basic items, um, we also uh, understood that we needed uh, vans. In our agency, we share vehicles, so we can um, assign a peer to pick somebody up if they can't make it to the group if they um, are further away. Um, you know, the initial um, intake forms um, and palms, they take a time. Um, not every individual that comes in um, will be easy, as easily asked these questions, so it might take a little more time. And what I would suggest when you start out with the palms is that you really um, go very slow with them, explain them. Some people that start the program um, have really a, a lot of questions about what's going on. This is, for them, is a big deal, and everybody's a unique uh, person. And if you um, have um, some problems um, starting up the program, you can always reach out to Patrick and Emily for technical assistance. And, um, yeah, I think we can go to the next slide. Um, does anybody have a question regarding the preparation and uh, starting of the um, getting brainstorming and, and things like that as of now? Um, nothing's been posted yet, nope. Okay. Um, the biggest barrier that we face and we still face is that we noticed very early on that transportation was a big problem. And I know this might be a big problem for many of, um, of you, um, we have Lower Passaic County um, that has a lot of transportation available, and Upper Passaic County um, does not so much. So we um, are trying to think of ways, innovative ways, that we could um, get people linked up to transportation services. 
Here in New Jersey, we have um, New Jersey Tips. Um, which is a program uh, run through the state of New Jersey through Rutgers University that offers an advocate uh, to go out uh, if somebody of the group needed help um, learning how to use the bus, transportation, or the train. Um, they actually assign an advocate to somebody, and that advocate will go out with them three times. Um, we'll go with the bus, we'll go with the train, and they will go take them on other transportation modes. So I tried to talk about that during the group as well. Um, consider accessibility when choosing a group meeting. Um, make sure that you have accessibility. Uh, we had two of our individuals that are meeting in the group. Um, they have um, back problems. Um, one person was walking with a cane, so that's very, very important. Um, also, we don't, didn't want to exclude people that have physical disabilities, such as wheelchairs and, and things like that. Um, and since we also share, like I said in the beginning, um, cars and vans with other programs, we had to pick a day, of course, where there wouldn't be so many cars and vans utilized so that we could at least use one vehicle to transport, um, you know, our individuals back and forth. And logistics, again, bringing that back, just like paper, the, the paper alone is very costly. Um, I'm constantly making copies um, that had to be included also in the grant, and that was part of um, the money that we are utilizing also. So um, does anybody have a question on that so far? I think we have one, as I can see. Do we want to address yes. that or just go to the next slide? Um, we can address it now if you want. Um, yeah, yeah. Norm, yeah. Norm asked, with all the prep, what sort of participation did you get and now have? Um, we started with six individuals. Um, um, it started very slow at first, but then we got one after the other. Uh, one week I had two, and then all of a sudden I had six, and that went very well. And then we started having problems, but I'll go into that a little further. Um, Mainly, the, like I said, the big thing was the transportation. Also, um, a lot of the individuals had um, severe anxiety while getting on the buses. And I did um, one or two days uh, one of the groups, I did um, go on the bus with them and travel train them to the group and back home. So that was just one thing that I did. Um, yeah. So, um, and the other question? Um, how did you obtain how did you obtain grants to help fund the things you needed? Um, we got the grant actually from MHA America, and we, because we have other peer programs here, we don't actually take the money, but we can have peers that are working in the other peer programs help us out once in a while to do the transportation and such. But we didn't actually get extra money; we're just including things together and we try as much as we can uh, to limit um, you know things like overall cost of things so we try to minimize that and that's how we are getting along so far it, okay um, the next does anybody have a next question um, Norm also asked why an intro letter um, because it's a good idea when you send a flyer out to an agency, you might call them. And when you call them, um, they, they want like an introduction um, about the, the It's My Life program. Um, a lot of times, you know, It's My Life is a little bit different because there's money involved. And they want to know basically, uh, sometimes you get agencies that don't have peers working in their agency. So you have to kind of... Um, introduce the peer program to them. Is there any other questions so far? No other questions, but a compliment. You're adapting to group members' needs sounds great. Well done. And I would agree right. with that. All right. Thank you so much. So I'm going to go on to the next slide then, if that's okay. Sure. Seems to be stuck right now, but one second. <laughs> There we go. Um, like I said in the beginning, um, it's very hard to start a group. So 
we had several starts. We had actually two starts, one in April, and we did have two members. Um, but then we went out and did our presentations, and um, we thought, no, you've got to restart it over again because it doesn't give people enough time to present this and, and get it out to their staff. So don't get discouraged when that ha happens. Just, you know, have confidence. Also, if that's a problem, just reach out to Patrick and, and Emily for support, and they can explain how to really get things going. I just thought the best way to do it was to go to, like, the peer programs and then other agencies that we were working with anyway to our other peer programs. So we had contacts. I just renewed the contracts over, and I keep on, like I said, it's, an, it's a process that it's ongoing. And um, it's always great to keep in contact with um, case managers, uh, managers and stuff that really do, um, you know, that you have contact with is just keep updating them. Um, one of the barriers was um, that two of my members decided to drop out, um, one because of severe anxiety um, and the other one um, because you see it in the, in, uh, the third bullet um, that one that I said, remember some family members and significant others will have increased concerns regarding their loved ones' independence and progress. So it's also when you're working with individuals, sometimes their family have a great input into what they do in their recovery. And... It's also a growing process, not only for the individual, but also for the family member. And so in that case, the family member was really hard on that person, and so they decided um, they, wouldn't, they had so much anxiety and it was causing them so much distress that I thought in the end it wasn't even um, productive, so that person was really having a hard time. Uh, but I also suggested to those members that had really had anxiety and a hard time of it um, that they could um, start with, I referred them then to the other peer program for one-on-one -on -one match for four months, and then maybe after these four months they would be in a better place um, so that they could return back to the program if they wanted to. Um, Another barrier is that you might run into that I ran into is that sometimes members who initially are paired up will not be a good fit. It's happened with us just recently. Uh, two members uh, went out on um, to the movies, and um, all of a sudden that didn't go so well. And um, they, the one person said, I don't want to work with him anymore. And um, we have to encourage um, and when you work with members in the groups, we have to encourage the members to bring up their concerns during the group. So uh, it is a group discussion, and it doesn't get put on just on a life coach. Um, it's just one of those things. They are individuals. Some individuals get along, and then they won't get along, and that's just part of living um, in, in the community also, um, myself, sometimes I can get along with somebody better, and then sometimes I don't. But it's, it's, don't be discouraged when that happens. Um, just encourage members to talk about their concerns. And um, maybe we can go to the next slide then. I think. Um, I think... For myself, I think individual life coach sessions are more productive when individuals um, are working on their goals, working together with the life coach. Um, then you can spend more time working on it. You, go in, you can go into details if they want to. A lot of times they don't want to work with a life coach one-on-one, -on -one and they just go through the group sessions and they do fine, but others might not. Um, I thought myself, you know, it's not a big deal. People could socialize. And then I brought it back to myself, and it was very humbling when I brought it back to myself, and I thought to myself, wow, didn't you just a couple of years ago try to go to a meet-up group, and you tried three times to leave the house, and you, you step back in the house and get, so I can't do it. And then finally you went out, you took a deep breath, and all of a sudden you went to that group, and it turned out to be the best thing that could have happened to you. And um, that's what happened to me, and that, that, that's where I can relate to it most, that it is a big deal, and it is change. And change sometimes can be very meaningful, 
but it can also be a hard thing to do. Um, don't think you have to know it all. Um, you know, it's okay to say, I don't know. You know, I, I don't know everything. And uh, let's find out together. Bring it back to the group again. Hey, guys, do you guys know where such and such is? Oh, where is that theater? Where can we go and get free movie tickets? You know, there are things out there um, that they might know of that you might not have a clue about. Um, what do others in the group think, you know? Um, again, bringing it back to the group and, and do some of the tough work together. You don't have to do it all by yourself. And also a big, big component to, to is that because you want to make sure that you're taking good care of yourself while you're running a group. It can be hard work. It's not always easy, um, but in the end it pays off. But while you're doing this work, you always have to put yourself first and take care of yourself first. And if you're having a difficulty with that, talk to somebody. Talk to Patrick. Talk to Emily. I bring it back to them and ask for technical assistance if you need it. Um, do we have another? Or is that, that's the last one, I think, right? Do I have one more? Um, yeah. Um. So I'll take over here. And yeah. I realized while Denise was talking that we probably have some people on who are not already familiar with the program. So I thought that maybe would give you a, a more of a description of how the program actually works which may help you to figure out questions and comments and suggestions. The, the program is based around an original program that we did several years ago where we had full-time peer specialists working in the program, and everybody worked one-on-one -on -one with a peer specialist. When they come into the program, and this is the same as it is now, each person is encouraged to develop their own social goals and figure out what it is that they want this program to accomplish or help them to accomplish. And so people come up with these social goals. And it may be, as I said, that the, you know, the real goal for people is to have friends, but the way to do it may be different. So we always encourage people to look into the community to figure out things that they enjoy doing. And then if they can participate in those activities in the community, it's far more likely that they will be around other people who like the same thing they do. And this opens up opportunities for developing relationships. In the original program, the peer specialist would sometimes accompany the person to the activities so that they could get over that kind of fear of change that we all experience. You know, change is difficult. And um, it can be scary, even when we know it's something we really want. It's still kind of a risky thing to shake things up and do something differently. So we had the, the peer specialist go with it. In the new program, what we've done by creating the support group is that people team up in the support group. It can be two people, it can be three people, however people want to team up. And each of those people identifies their own goals and then they develop a plan about how they're going to achieve that goal. So for instance, in a program, uh, a pilot that we did, we had one woman, and I've told this story before, so those of you who are familiar with it, just bear with me. But we had one woman who really was very, very shy, and she knew that she had never in her life started a conversation with a stranger. And so she talked, to the group, she talked to the peer specialist, and she tried to figure out how could she get into an environment and a situation where she would have this opportunity to overcome this fear, and this would open up opportunities to create better relationships, maybe leading to really good supportive friendship. So her idea was to go to Starbucks, and originally she was going to go one time a week. And in the beginning, she just went and she had whatever drink it was she wanted, and she sat there and just watched people come and go. As her plan progressed, because what we try to do is people develop these plans that they can succeed in steps. So, for instance, her first week was to just go. 
Her second week might be to go twice. Her third week might be to just say hello to somebody at the counter if, she, if she's seen them before. So what she found out was if she went on the same days each week and at the same time, she would see people over and over again because people were getting breaks from work or, you know, coming back from some activity. And so she would see familiar faces. And I remember the time she wrote in her journal, because each participant keeps a journal, she wrote in her journal that for the first time she said hello to people that came by her table. She said, hi, it's, you know, it's good to see you again. And that was as much as she felt comfortable with. Eventually, this began to grow. And she ended up with this group that she continues to participate in to this day that she calls her Starbucks. She goes at the same time each week, the same days each week, and sometimes the same people are there. And she now has had discussions. And she was so proud of herself for the first time she actually had a conversation with a stranger. And now it's something that's become a regular part of her life, and she's actually developed some relationships out of this where they do other things besides this going to have coffee. So we have people trying to figure out, you know, what do I like to do? And people like to do many different things. Some people like to go to movies. Some people might want to take an art class. And frequently in communities, there are community art classes at community centers that may be free or very low cost. And we had one woman in one group that her passion, the thing that she loved to do, was to bake. And so working with the, the uh, support group, she was able to identify a meetup group that was for bakers. And so she started going to that, and a local kitchen gave them space where they could, they could participate in their baking activities. And she developed a whole circle of friends through this baking activity that started with a single meetup group. We benefited from it because each time she came back to the group, she brought us free bake goods. So we had cakes and donuts and breads and all kinds of things. So it was, it was a good experience for all of us. Part of the program is what we call the social budget. And one of the reasons we gave out eight grants last year, in the last year, of $5,000 per affiliate that that signed up for it and were chosen to get the grant. And the primary reason for that 5000 was so that we could provide some money that each person would have access to. Now, most of the people who come into this program, people who are very isolated and very lonely, also tend to be people who um, probably are on SSI, or at least many of them are on SSI and Medicaid. And SSI, as you know, is a very low amount of money each month and doesn't really provide you with any money for social activities. So in our initial group, we provided each person who participated with a $60 a month social budget. It doesn't have to be $60 a month. It can be $30 a month. You know, when you, when you have no money to spend on social activities, even a small amount is a bonus to you and allows you to get out of the house and do something and come in contact with other people. We chose $60 because, as you're probably aware, when you're on SSI, the first $60 that you receive extra does not detract or take away from your SSI benefit. As you go beyond that, and some people might have other income coming in, um, there is a there's a formula that SSI uses so that, you know, for every dollar you get in, then you lose a certain amount of your benefit. But the $60 for most people is a very safe amount. And that was the primary reason for this $5,000 grant. Now, as the groups are small in the beginning, you can also use some of that funds for, as Denise talked about, you know, um, copying to produce flyers so that you can hand them out Wherever peers might be found, <clears throat> you know, you can go to multiple places. If in your community or nearby your community, 
you have drop-in centers or clubhouses or respite facilities or other provider agencies. We know that many of the people that we've had come through these programs have been participants in ACT teams, ACT, Assertive Community Treatment Teams. These sometimes, depending on the state you live in, for instance, when I was doing this in Florida, it was called FACT teams, Florida Assertive Community Treatment Teams. I understand in New Jersey it's called FACT teams. Don't really know what the P stands for. But um, uh, it's, Virginia, called, it's, the same thing. it's called Program for Assertive, assertive Community Treatment. Well, you solved the mystery for me. Thank you. (laughs) That's what it stands for. (laughs) So any place like this is is a good place to go. You know, assertive community treatment is the the most intensive type of outpatient treatment that people can get in almost any public health system for uh, psychiatric issues. And so these are the people who also tend to be the most isolated and the most um, disconnected from the world around them. So that's a good good place to go. When we did the original pilot for the program, we only chose people who were with a PAC team in Virginia. We also chose people that were all on SSI. And also for our original pilot, the first group, of, I think it was uh, 12 people that came into the group, um, we only chose people who had a very severe diagnosis. Generally, it was a diagnosis of schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder, sometimes bipolar disorder, major depression. But we chose people with those, particularly the thought disorders, because statistically, people with that type of issue in their life have the most difficult time forming bonds and friendships. Um, we know, for instance, there's a statistic out there that's very sad that people with a diagnosis of schizophrenia are six times less likely to ever marry than other people in society. And so we thought we would test the program originally with people who really, really needed something like this, and it was a tremendously successful. Our original outcomes... <clears throat> Denise referred to the POM, which is a a quality of life measure called personal outcome measures. And it's an interview process where people um, talk about what's available in their life and what's not available in their life. And so you're able to take this quality of life and you can score it with a numerical score. Funding agencies love it when you can give them numbers instead of narratives. So it's a very useful tool, but it's mostly useful because you can understand how a person feels about their own quality of life. And so if you do a baseline uh, POM with an individual and you can see how they feel coming into the program, and then later periodically or when they exit the program, do another POM interview, you can see if their quality of life, according to the individual, has gotten better or maybe gotten worse or changed in any way in different areas. And we found out that in our first two groups that we really studied quite closely, we had an average of a 65% increase in quality of life of the people who participated in the program. Because by the end of the the year-long program, every person in the group At the beginning, every single person in those two first groups, their main goal was to have a friend. And at the end of that year, every person said that they had a friend, and maybe their next part of their goal was to have more friends. So we felt really good about that. We also looked at some other things. We looked at things like we asked people questions, and they didn't have to answer them if they didn't want to, because this is not a clinical program by any means. It's a social program. But we did ask people if they would let us know in the two years prior to entering the program how many times they might have been hospitalized or had an emergency room visit due to their diagnosis. And We asked at the end of the program the same question. In the year, actually I think we ran the first group for 18 months, in that period, how many hospitalizations or emergency 
room visits did you experience? And universally for both groups and since then, we've seen an average drop of over 75% in rehospitalization rates and emergency room usage. So we know that these programs are producing very positive changes in people's lives. And we've constantly asked people who participate in the program to give us feedback. And so we did a, a satisfaction survey that asked people about their feelings about various aspects of the program. And we know, and almost anybody who's ever done a satisfaction survey, if you like hand it out to somebody and you know who's filling out that satisfaction survey, well, they're going to probably want to tell you what they think you want to hear. So we made sure that we did anonymous satisfaction surveys. People filled out these, these surveys on their own. We didn't know who filled them out and who didn't. And there was no name or any kind of identifying information. And at each meeting, they would drop them in a box. And then they were mixed up with all the others. And we saw again, uh, I think it was about a 70 or 75% completely positive reaction to the program. And then with the things that were not 100, it was, a, it was a Likert scale, so people rated it on a one to five basis, one being um, they liked it the least and five being they liked it the most. And we had, like I say, about 70, 75% of people who scored it at the highest rating. Everyone else scored it at the next highest rating. There was nothing below that in either of those first two groups. One of the issues I think Denise mentioned is sometimes family members will be very concerned and sometimes clinicians will be very concerned because the people that might benefit from this program are very vulnerable people. And so they're afraid that there's going to be stressors for them that they may or may not be able to handle. And that's why Denise, as she said, you know, people can come into the program, but if it's stressing them, there is no issue with them withdrawing from the program. And if they want to come back later, that's wonderful. And so you have to make sure that you assure families of this. That this is not something that's mandatory. It's not something that people are going to be judged on. We're not trying to find out who worked the hardest, who performed the best in the program, any of that. We're just trying to offer something that gives people an opportunity to reach those social goals that they identify. Some of the other programs or problems that people run into, um, a big one really is transportation. And transportation is frequently, I think, in, in uh, surveys done all over the country, transportation and housing are usually in the top three um, biggest problems that people face when they're living with a major diagnosis and, and, and particularly people living on SSI. And so that $5,000, part of that budget can also be used, for instance, to help people get bus passes. Most communities offer special rates of bus passes for people living with disabilities. And so the group can help people find out where they go to do this and, and make sure that people have a way to pay for it. Um, transportation doesn't always exist in every community. And so right now we're actually trying to figure out a way that we can offer a program similar to this but for people who live in rural areas or frontier states, you know, where it's hundreds of miles between towns and cities and mental health centers. So this would primarily be either telephonic or online, and we're trying to figure out how you can still get that full experience of, of building relationships without coming together face-to-face -face in a group. But we know it's a real problem, and so we're dedicated to trying to find some solutions for it. Um, you know, we want to really emphasize, and Denise did emphasize this in her presentation, that in the beginning, it's really important that you promote this program every way you can. And, and Denise and her group did an excellent job doing press releases and flyers, and you can do brochures. 
You can give talks at community centers. You can go to facilities like drop-in centers and clubhouses and um, even community mental health centers where you might be able to have an event where people come together to hear about this program and have the opportunity, if they're interested, to sign up. They go through an introduction with the, the people running the program so that they fully understand what it is that they're signing up for before they make a commitment. And it's not for everyone. And some people from the very beginning say, this is not for me. Um, maybe later on, if some of their friends have gone through the program and they begin to hear more positive things about it, then they'll be likely to engage. You know, we do know that where there are facilities like clubhouses and drop-in centers and um, events being held by mental health providers and organizations like Mental Health Association, Mental Health America, or even NAMI, um, that, and support groups like DBSA and all of this, we know that people form friendships with people through these kinds of events. And that's very important. Everybody needs some degree of friendship. But it is also important that, that your experience extend beyond just the mental health rule. And it's, one, because it's taking back your rightful place in the community. And that is a wonderful feeling for anybody who feels like they've been excluded. That accomplishment alone, just feeling that you've done something in the community and you're now an active part of it, you're included, you're not just integrated into things that are available, but you're actually included as a member of the community, is a real goal all into itself. Um, so, you know, like I said, we're going to create this forum that we want to hear from people and we want to hear questions, we want to hear comments. And I see we've got a number of comments out there. So, Emily, if you want to uh, read some out to us, and then Denise and I can take turns if whoever's uh, sure. prepared to help. Oh. Um, yes. So one question is, how similar are, are these groups to NAMI's connections? NAMI volunteers and recovery facilitate their meetings, but the structure sounds pretty different, Norm said. And, Denise, are you familiar with the NAMI connections? No, not really, no, because okay. uh, we we do not have a NAMI group here in uh, Passaic County, that's why. Okay, well, I, I am familiar with it, and, and they are very different. Again, NAMI Connections tries to connect you to some people who are volunteers from the community and also is a, uh, a social activity for people. But this is a self-directed program where you go out yourself, for instance, with this budget that we provide people with, they get to decide how that money is going to be spent. If they, you know, for instance, the lady who went to Starbucks, she budgeted each week a certain amount for the cost of going to Starbucks. Now, as part of a self-directed program or self-directed care program, you also then have a responsibility to keep track of how you use that money. So each person in the group develops what we call a social budget. They say, I'm going to spend this amount of money on this activity over the next month. And then at the end of the month, people turn in their report that shows how they spent the money. Now, you can change what you want to spend it with. You just have to let the group know that and make a change in your, in your budget. Uh, but people have control themselves. They get to decide what the activities are. They get to decide, you know, how much they're going to participate and where they're going to go. And really, the goals are the major thing. That people have such a wide variety of goals, and those goals change. People can come into the program, and for instance, the lady who developed the Starbucks, for instance, well, she went on to uh, involve, get involved, I think, with a, a community art because she also liked to draw. So she started taking um, some art lessons at a community center. And, you know, it was a little bit harder for her because she was very self-conscious about her talent, her ability to draw. 
But in the end, she ended up enjoying it. And the last time I was in communication with her, she still has her Starbucks friends, and now she also has these classes. And I think these classes change as time goes by. So while there's some similarity to NAMI Connections, it's a much more self-directed program. It involves a much wider array of connections in the community, ultimately, for each person. And it really gives people that sense of um, change will happen at the pace that I want it to. And that's really important because, as we said before, change can be scary. So I hope that answered your question. Next one. Um, we had some other comments about um, Kelly Lawson was mentioning um, talking, thinking about starting an art therapy session or planting a planting session where they can talk and have fun um, and get, you know, get to know each other while also building skills. So that's an sure. idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, that's um, Denise. You go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, um, through this program, there are also uh, skills building um, lessons that we use. So I normally do when in my one and a um, half hours, I normally do a half an hour of the skills building, uh, whereby we, um, for instance, I believe one of them is. Uh, friendships and um, giving praise when you work with somebody or working together and they're different different topics and so we do that for half an hour we discuss that uh, but we've also done things to where um, all of us gone, have gone out to a nearby coffee shop have ordered uh, coffee and just had a conversation outside um, of the uh, of the agency and just sat and had a good time and laughed um, sometimes laughter, I feel, is, is the best medicine and just being together and, and just being comfortable and talking. I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that people taught us when we first designed this program was that, you know, the intention of the program was to get people to connect outside of the mental health community. But we also found out very quickly that the people in the group wanted to socialize with each other. Too. And there was a, it, it actually was a very useful stepping stone for people because all of a sudden they had a larger group of people they were connected with. I think any kind of activity like that, um, you know, that planting idea is wonderful. You, you really feel like you're accomplishing something. And, mm -hmm. and it is a chance to practice your skills. And so you can kind of build these activities maybe around a particular skill that the group has decided that they want to work on as a group. So I think that's a wonderful idea. Emily? Um, another comment that Norm made, um, that people under 65 don't typically get SSI and wanted to know if you were talking more about persons with disabilities who receive SSDI or if he was missing something about SSI. No, um, we, I don't know if you want to go off. Oh. Um, I'll go. We accept anybody, whether they have SSI or SSD, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, um, it, it, basically we have ages from, it's very, um, for instance, here at the agencies that we get our, most of our referrals from, basically, or peer programs, there are also a lot of people that are above 65 years of age and they belong to um, the older generation, but they're also very isolated. So we do not, um, you know, separate those two from each other um, and rather bring them together uh, because they are also part of the um, disabled uh, or disabilities community, uh, mental health disabilities community, and um, I, I just include them as well. I have never separated them too. I don't know what you think about that, Patrick. Well, I would say 65% um, of people who receive services in the public health system, so community mental health generally, um, are on Medicaid. Medicaid is the, the, the medical insurance service that you get um, if you don't have a work history and the way to qualify for it is to qualify for SSI, Social Security Supplemental Income. SSDI is for people who do have a work history, um, and, and I know this because I was uh, 
at one point in my life, I was on SSDI for almost 10 years. And with SSDI, you receive Medicare, which is a much smaller amount of people with major diagnoses. So, you know, they can be confusing about which one's which. But um, actually, SSDI has gotten really difficult for people under 65 to get. And you can't get DI over 65 because you're eligible right away then for, well, SSD, yeah, I think, yeah. Now, but, it's confusing. Um, I, I thought I asked yeah. my members, all six of them, I said, uh, wouldn't it be a good idea to bring somebody in so they could teach you something about SSI, SSD? And they all agreed. They, they, um, yeah. We brought it up one time to bring resources and to do presentations during a group. And they, they said, we'd love it. So there was all buy-in into that because they also want to know what's out there besides when they go out into the community. And it's, it's good to have also for a resource uh, for themselves, uh, telephone numbers that they might be contacting, uh, especially the bus system or train system. Um, I had New Jersey Transit come in and explain, you know, the schedules and things like that. So that was really um a good thing to come in and, and have those resources come in and do the presentation. Yeah, and, and it is a good idea if you can provide people with some clarity about how the various benefits were, both the, the ones from Social Security, but also like community benefits or state benefits that they might be eligible to, like discounts and things like that. So yes, bringing in uh, some kind of information from the outside, whether it's a speaker or, or materials, is good. But again, SSI, most people actually end up on SSI um, because, you know, th for the majority of people, their first symptoms occur in their late teenage years in that transition time of going from a youth to a young adult. Th this. It's not the same for everyone, but that's the most frequent time when people start experiencing symptoms. So they haven't had an opportunity for a couple of things. One, they haven't had opportunities to have a work history, but also they haven't had opportunities to learn how to have good relationships. They may have had some high school relationships, but they haven't found out you know, what it takes to build a lasting relationship in their life. So anything we can do to to reconnect them to that theme of experiences is positive. Emily? Um, oh, we just got one more in. So Nor mentioned his NAMI group has ages 18 to 78, um, come with no income or other requirements. They can just, they can just show up. Um, and despite the idea that it's very structured, his NAMI Connections group and some kind of a class, it's still an organic program of shared experiences. Yeah, and it is. I mean, I, I worked for NAMI at one point, and, and it is a good program. It's just a little different from this one. Um, and you don't have to be on benefits to participate in this program. Mm -hmm. um, some people, you know, have not gotten on to benefits yet. They may have you know, just recently wound up within the mental health system and where uh, they haven't been able to qualify at this point. So, you know, and it, and it provides an opportunity for interaction and social connection and all this for people who are feeling so disconnected, especially when, you know, they, they don't have a regular income or those kinds of support. So, yeah, but NAMI Connections is an excellent program. Um, and other than that, that's, those are all the comments and questions we've gotten so far. Okay. Well, I don't know if you want to hang said, on for a bit. Yeah, we can hang on for a few minutes. And, um, you know, we, we're hoping um, sometime towards the end of the year that we will have some additional grant money to give out new grants to other groups around the country. Our, our real goal for these programs is to get them started. And so that $5,000, it's not a lot of money, but it's seed money for uh, an affiliate or any other organizations. We also like to give grants to peer-run organizations who want to do this. Um, 
but it's seed money to get the program started. And then if the organization sees success, we hope that they can then fund it through their local or state um, opportunities that, for funding. Um, so, you know, keep checking with us. And as I said, you, you can you can find our information by going to just one word, centerforpeersupport.org, and then you will see a section for uh, what we frequently call SSDC or social, uh, social self-directed care. We also, its proper name is It's My Life Peer Partners. And on that site, you can you can also see some of the materials from the original program, which was It's My Life Social Explorations, and that's the one where you worked face-to-face, one-on-one with a peer specialist throughout the program. We just got a question about how do you qualify for a grant? What we did, it's, it's very simple, really. We asked um, our affiliates, and, and we started off just going out to our affiliates because we knew there was interest. Um, we asked the affiliates to, uh, to tell us how they plan to utilize the grant, what they saw as the need in their community, and uh, you know what um, assets they could bring to the program themselves. You know, having uh, Peer support staff is very important. So it's you know some affiliates don't have peer specialists working for them. We were looking for ones that did. Um, now you know peer specialists are called a number of different things around the country, but basically most of us know what we're talking about. But it's peer support workers uh, who have achieved some degree of credentialing. There's three states that don't have any credential for peer support, but they still have people working. One of them is California that has over 6,000 peer support employees working, but they don't have any kind of certification. So I'm getting off the subject. But we look, we look to make sure that there's the availability of peer support, that they have the availability of a place to meet, that they may be able to bring additional resources into the program, and we really want to know how they uh, judge the need within their community and what they hope to accomplish. And when they're ready, we will be sending out um, letters. And so if you think you will be interested, that's one thing you can post on our site. And again, the site for posting won't be open um, for a couple of weeks yet, but you can uh, you can email uh, Emily. Would it be okay for them to email you? Sure, yes. Okay, Emily's email, you can take it now, but you, we'll also put it on the website so you can find it, and mine too. Uh, but in, in our organization, we use first initial, so E, and then Emily's last name is Scahill, so it's S-K-A-H-I-L-L. -L. That's right, isn't it? S-K-E. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put it in the, I'll pop it in the chat box. Okay. And that's at mentalhealthamerica.net or a .net, not .org. But she'll put it in there for you. I always misspell people's names. Um, other questions? And I just pulled yours up, Patrick, too. Okay. And Denise's is there also. Mm-hmm. And any of you who are on this this uh, call today who are working the program yourself, we would love to know more about your experience. Uh, we'd like to know what the problems are you're facing and anything that, that's prevented you from accomplishing what you want to do or any new ideas you have about a better way to do things. So if there are no other new questions, I think we're going to end early. Uh, Denise, do you have any last words? Um, no, I'm good. Um, I just, you know, <laughs> encourage everybody just to go forward. Um, you know, it's it's work, but it's it's good work to see people develop and, and, and really go out into their feeling. You know, I do the, um, the Depression Bipolar Support Alliance groups. And the one thing I always hear is I say to them, hey, how are you doing? And they say, I'm lonely. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to go about it. 
And when you hear that and you have a program like this and you match one with the other, you know, and you see um, how um, some of the members here in my group are all of a sudden getting along and they, you know, hey, where is this person? Why isn't he here today? Why didn't he show up? Um, is he okay? You know, um, so it's, it's kind of building a little community within a community, and I think that's a great thing. Thank you. That's wonderful. So we're going to end a little early, and thank you all for participating, and please continue to send in your comments, questions, and suggestions. Thank you. Thank you.